my my ward counselor Jonathan Paz uh, is going to be running for city. He's going to be running for mayor, challenging <laughs> Mayor McCarthy. And uh, I first met Jonathan when he was canvassing to run for city council, and he uh, came by my door. We had a nice chat, and then I was like, "Oh, I wonder who he's running against." And promptly had the incumbent come by, and also had a nice chat with him. And I kind of could, could, got, got like a better feeling from Jonathan, I would say. And I feel like he, that has sort of been borne out in the, the the overall performance of him on city council. And I think that sort of was shown in how he characterized it in his, his opening speech, which was, was seemed almost like a salvo against Mayor McCarthy in the way that she's been running things, because he portrayed himself as in earnest working hard to try to like introduce things that were popular with his constituents and not getting the reception that is required to get things done in the city and it was i thought a uh it was a very nice day a little chilly but in the sun it was nice and it was fitting because the uh, mbta commuter rail came through part way through <laughs> uh that is my spiel but that is the uh yeah Jonathan Paz is running for mayor officially. So Jonathan Paz is running for mayor. Uh, there's a lot to be said on this, and we don't really have a clear linear progression of this conversation. But I guess what I want to start with is by saying that uh, anyone listening to this uh, is probably a fan of Jonathan Paz, right? Probably already knows who Jonathan Paz is. Uh, but what they might not realize is that Jonathan Paz is not as popular as your friend circle suggests. And so if you're listening to this and you want Jonathan Paz to be mayor, you yourself that are listening to this has to work really, really hard uh, on Jonathan's campaign. Uh, so just put it, put it into perspective. Um, Jonathan Paz, the last two election cycles has run in Ward 9. Ward 9 sees the least a number of voters turn out in any other ward in Waltham. Uh, the last election, uh, which was a non-mayoral, Jonathan Paz won with 700 people voting in total in his ward. In the mayoral election, which is where it's similar uh, voter turnout is gonna be this year, he won with 900. Uh, and how many people voted in total in the mayoral election in that same year? It was 12,000. Uh, so you're gonna see a little bit more um, this year, uh, because the population has grown. Um, and also I feel like, I don't know, I feel like, you know, I just hopeful that people are gonna turn out more than usual uh, for this. Um, so maybe you'll see 13,000 people vote. So pause, untested in that arena, untested. We have really only have anecdotal evidence. We have no idea how well Jonathan Paz is gonna do at large. Um, and it should be noted that Ward 9 is the most democratically leaning ward uh, in the in the city. I'm using um, anecdotal evidence of um, the Yes on 4 campaign, which is the um, uh, transgender question in 2018, I wanna say, um, along with uh, the Elizabeth Warren, um, re-election uh, that just happened uh, recently. Um, and so according to that data, uh, Ward 9 is the most democratic. Leading. As you leave that, um, it gets more conservative. And as you go higher north, it gets it gets substantially more conservative. And so, and so Jonathan is untested in that category and it's going, it, I think it's completely 100% winnable. Jonathan Paz knows how to do politics. He's got all the information necessary to him. He's got all of the volunteers necessary to him. All he needs to do is be super organized and take this super seriously. And I think he can win. Uh, I think that he is the underdog and I think it's an uphill battle. And so if you want Jonathan Paz to win, you have to work on his campaign. You have to knock on doors. You have to call people and you have to uh, talk to your, your friends and neighbors and get them out to vote. Because Je Jeanette McCarthy is way more popular than... Uh, than outside of your than inside of your circle suggests. Everyone listening to this probably doesn't like the mayor. Everyone that doesn't listen to this, they probably like the mayor. That's a, that's a good point. And also, that does reflect the the amount of like money and effort that Jonathan's going to have to put into running because. Oh yeah. So so Chris, can I just clarify? Are you saying it's impossible? 
but also possible. I'm sorry, you're no, saying no, it's no. I'm saying it's absolutely no, no. I, I, did, I, did I say that? I, th I think I said winnable. I think I think I said it is winnable. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Okay, okay. Totally, Jim McCarthy is totally beatable. Uh, but it's, a, it just, it's just an uphill battle. And James talking about money. You want to talk about money? Uh, Diane LeBlanc, uh, which is Jeanette McCarthy's last opponent, um, outspent Jeanette McCarthy, not in total, outspent by $77,000. And Jeanette McCarthy won by 3,000 votes. If I'm sure if somebody uh, that was into data looked at that, um, in relation to all of the races in Massachusetts history, I bet it's up there in top three as proportionately dollar spent to vote lost. Um, I bet it, it's insane. And so I'm sure Jonathan is looking at that number um, and certainly worried, but Jonathan's a great fundraiser. I don't think he's gonna have a problem raising money. Also, I think working in his favor is just like, what feels like a lot of unforced errors almost in terms of like, like public, like, relations that the, the almost debacles that didn't need to happen both with like the farm with like uh -huh. the fernold with the uh, with um healthy waltham mm -hmm. and had need to hastily get a new place like yeah we this, talked this, yeah. yeah we've talked about all this so. yeah no we talked about it we talked about how awful the optics look for the mayor right now and jonathan is capitalizing on that i wonder how long ago he made this decision but yeah we've been talking about it in the past like five six months the optics for the mayor are so so bad and now it's jonathan's mission to make the messaging right you've got all of the necessary pieces to make the mayor look bad and you've got to be able to convince people uh people that don't like the mayor to show up to vote because your messaging is good and you've got to convince the people that like the mayor to not like the mayor anymore because of these issues because like we care about these issues we talk about them all the time but does the average uh walthamite do they care about the farm that they've never been to and don't see any of the farm produce from do they care about the food pantry that they've never been to and only sees traffic and a human line a bread line do they care about these things so jonathan's mission is to make his messaging right to make those people care because they might not already I think um, Chris touches on something that'll come up a lot. You know, there were, uh, Mayor McCarthy has a very powerful interpersonal network. Um, there's a lot of people who know her as a person and have known her as a person for a long time. And uh, those folks, a lot of folks in Waltham who vote, get their information about what's going on through personal uh, a personal network, and they're happy with that. They feel like that's a good way to get it. So they're not getting their information from professional news media or from social media, um, including Channel 781. And that will inevitably change. And the reason is because more there were more people, but also because of the way housing prices are, fewer people are gonna live in one place for in Waltham for life. People who grow up here might not be able to live, live here when they grow up. You know, people who live here now might not live here when they retire. So inevitably there will be a point where the number of people who are learning about the community and connecting to the community over social media or some other type of media outnumbers the people who are have these personal connections. I don't know if that's happened yet. If that does, when and if that does happen, Mayor McCarthy's in trouble because she doesn't use me, she doesn't call back reporters, she doesn't use social media to the full extent. She very much prioritizes those people who are, have the personal, who are part of her personal network because those people are her priority. And as Chris have said, a lot of people voted for her in the last election. The, if you just, I'm not sure, we should look at it by percentages, but if you just look at it by numbers, the number of votes that Paz has gotten his past elections is nowhere near what he would need to beat her in this election. But there are other good reasons to believe he could win, such as the fact that he pulled off a pretty much unexpected victory to get on the council against a long serving incumbent. Um, he's also, he's good at the things that the, that the mayor doesn't do, like talking to the public proactively about issues, um, using social media in a professional way to keep people updated on what he's doing. Um, so there are a lot of arguments you can make that he does have a chance, but it is going to be an uphill battle. I have a tougher question. If he wins, what happens? It, there would be a lot of people in government who are 
who so he has a reputation as very very far left i don't know if we necessarily see him that way but a lot of people in town do because he's so young there are people who would not be happy about a young leader who's younger than them um and because he would be the first non-white mayor of waltham there would be a lot of change and there would be certain people who want to see him fail and that could even include a uh, majority of the council, unless the council mm -hmm. really changes this year too. So um, that's, I think the risk is what if he gets elected and then he can't get anything done for four years. But the other side of that is things move really slowly already and there's already a lot of stuff not getting done. The other thing mm -hmm. is there are some ways he can make change right away. Um, the mayor spends a lot of time showing up to events and just showing different segments of the community that they're valued and different businesses that they're valued. And, and, and Paz would be really good at that. And he could make new segments of the population sort of feel like they belong and then they would be more engaged for the next time around. Um, and he also, if he were mayor, he could immediately change the way the city uses media, social media to communicate with people because he does a good job as that as a counselor. But uh, yeah, actually, I'm interested to hear both of your takes on that. What happens if he wins? I think that it's good to point out that he needs like a council to be able to work with him to really get stuff done. And I think it's also a little ray of sunlight in a lot of this is that we also have a template for what that looks like running because Colleen Bradley MacArthur has been sort of seen as like on his side by a lot of these same people and she was able to win the get 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 win in a large race which i think shows sort of where the wind is blowing at like the the citywide level for when jonathan runs if it's then the question of like what does turnout look like and what is like the citywide response look like and ideally we would also have a bunch of other people running to support him when he does get elected I think is kind of what would need to happen if we wanted to actually be something where it's effective and stuff that, we, that people actually want to get done. Yeah, something that someone's uh, people aren't talking about enough uh, in this one day since he's uh, uh, addressed this is um, is that there's going to be a new council in Ward 9. He's not going to run in Ward 9. So there's going to be a race in Ward 9, uh, at least two people. Um, and so completely new city council in Ward 9. I'm sure Paz has already got someone picked out. I don't know who that is yet, um, but I'm sure he wouldn't make this decision uh, without personally endorsing somebody. Um, so I'm very curious to see what's going on there. Um, to, to answer Josh's question about what would happen if he wins, uh, do you really have people that have been appointed to a position for 20 years be really, really mad that they just lost their job? Um, and so there's definitely going to be a lot of powers that be uh, trying to stop a Jonathan Paz mayoral campaign. There's probably uh, also going to be a lot of like leaking and stuff, or just people disaffected if and, if and when he does get elected. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that actually, anything. though, you touch on another way he could make change quickly, even if the city council was against him, and that is there's already vacancies on boards and commissions. So he could put mm. new people on boards and yeah. commissions. The council has to approve them. Mm -hmm. So they could fight him on it, but they can't fight him on everything when you have all these vacancies, right? No, I would be, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just the way things have always been done. But I don't think I've ever seen a committee placement not been approved. I would, it would just be uncharted territory if, if the council was like, nah, to, to yeah. anybody. Yeah, it would be interesting if, if after winning the council then felt like the need to to fight him every step of the way so that is yeah. that is an... i mean that's maybe that's how they paint it um you know if you win maybe that's how they did but there's plenty of good things to be done and if they slow roll for four years and whatever you know well you, the, the, sure the council helps. would need a new skill set to stand up to them right like yeah. they always every time the mayor wants them to vote for something and somebody opposes it somebody else well if we vote no what happened they don't know what happens when you don't do what the mayor says so they're gonna have to find out what happens when you don't go along with the mayor if that's where we end up of course it's possible we're gonna get a ton of new candidates um for city council and they'll all be victorious but that's not that's not the most likely outcome but that would be interesting well i thought we should show the clip i'll put it in later 
So this is a clip from, because it's, it's relevant to what we can expect to see in this race um, with Mayor McCarthy in Paz in it. Uh, so there was, I think two weeks ago at Committee of the Whole, there was a discussion about the MBTA Communities Act. There was another one more recently, which we're about to talk about. But at that discussion, Councillor Paz made a comment about the Armory Project that happened a few years, or that didn't happen a few years years ago. And the mayor seemed to take that very personally. So let's show that clip. I do generally have concerns about the city of Waltham developing affordable housing. Um, as a, a victim of this process, we couldn't even purchase the armory in, in my district to reconvert it into affordable housing. So uh, I will say that although I find this to be a very unfair mandate, uh, it's, it's, I think, a little bit disingenuous to say that we've actually carried this out. Um, also, as a former member of an affordable housing committee that made a report. Uh, we, we haven't exactly made this effort. So in earnest, I hope that the city, now that the mayor is forced to pay attention to it, everyone's forced to pay attention point to of, it. Point of personal um, privilege. Madam if, mayor. I could, if I could finish. It's a point of personal privilege. Madam Mayor. First of all, the armory was withdrawn by the applicant because they couldn't get assigned PNS. Secondly, if you want to criticize me, go ahead. It's not a. It's Council not a person. It's not a personal job, M Madam Mayor. It's. It's. it's no, it a, was. Just, you it's mentioned my name personally. I Ruin said a that. personal privilege. I, you want to speak what you feel, fine. But you said my name personally. I'm not in charge of zoning, Councillor. I can't even enter. We, we, we have. A, we have a very. It's. A, it's okay that we have a very different memory of the armory. That's not the. No, it's not a different point. memory. Point of personal privilege, Mr. President. Madam Mayor. Okay. You have received. All of you have received information from the petitioner that they could not get assigned PNS. And one thing I noticed there was she said, you said my name, but actually he said the mayor. So does she think her, her name is the mayor? I don't think so, but I think it brings up the point that because she's been in this role so long and it's such a big part of who she is, it's all personal. A, a, a criticism of her, it seems like she could take any criticism of her very personally. So unfortunately, I think it could be a very contentious race. Um, I think there are some people, including the mayor herself, who react very strongly. I would be, I don't know if there will be a debate as part of this race, but that would be really interesting based on that clip we just saw to see how they interact um, when the mayor's not totally in control of the situation. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's going to be very contentious, and it's very interesting to consider the relationship between the two. A um, uh, bit of um, personal history, uh, there are still people in Waltham that when I talk to them about Jonathan Paz, they say, oh, weren't you guys roommates? It's like, I've, seen, I've heard that many times, which is hilarious. The truth of that is that um, Jonathan and I were friends years ago, um, and I lived at 24 Browns Avenue and the way I acquired that space is because Jonathan lived at 22 Browns Avenue and so he turned me on to that vacancy when I needed a place to stay so we were neighbors um, not roommates which is what a lot of people in Waltham thought for some reason um, it's just how the uh, rumor mill goes and so and so I, I, I knew uh, Jonathan very well. And I remember the, the party he threw. It was a birthday party. Um, it was five years ago, four years ago. I can't remember if it was like right before his election or right after. Um, but Jeanette McCarthy was invited and showed up and gave him a key to the city. And Jonathan Paz, for, for a long time, since early on when I knew him, so I had high praise for the mayor. And now, five years later, uh, look where we're at. He's already already going negative. I'll, I'm going to throw a screen cap up of his... Uh, of his um, announcement, uh, talking about Jeanette McCarthy uh, in negative light already. Instead of being beholden to the people, this administration is beholden to special interests. Instead of feeding our seniors, veterans, and supporting our community farms and food pantries, this administration is threatening and harassing them. Instead of investing in our future, this administration is underfunding our schools. And so you, it's just a, it's just a, Tales. What do you think his turning point was? Um, I don't know. I mean, just just seeing or stonewalling everything. Just uh, you know, not you. You see the mayor. She's she's at everyone's bar mitzvahs, and you know, she's at things. She says hi. But then when you start like watching all these meetings, when you start like you know seeing the power dynamics, it just like it tells a different story.
I, I still sort of <clears throat> have, to, have to imagine that it's related to like some of the again like the farm stuff just a lot of the bad optics definitely feel like it's setting the stage for this and making it particularly opportune i i'm not sure if there's anything particularly driving it beyond that but it, it you can kind of see that he in that uh, exchange like he was the one sort of pushing the armory project initially to try to get more affordable housing like even if it is only like 25 units it's something and even that was apparently too much and it gets presented as if it was something that just just couldn't happen for some reason because like there was some in in, in a, so, some something irreconcilable with the person selling the land but we've got all these other projects that go through with no problem that are way more contentious yet somehow this was too much yeah yeah i was interested that he brought up the armory there because it's something we've used on the show when we first heard that the mayor was running for re-election we wanted to kind of introduce people to her without making a ton of generalization so we decided to kind of use the armory as an example we talked to christine mackin about her interpretation of it um, she said that there were a lot of legal questions that were left unanswered but when we asked paz about it he actually he mostly blamed the the property owner he said the property property owner just wasn't serious. And so that's interesting because in this meeting, when he brought it up, the mayor immediately heard that as him blaming her for it, which he kind of was because he, he was saying, you know, I don't know if the mayor is serious about housing. But um, she then sent uh, for the following week's e-docket, she sent um, to the council a copy of an email from Watch CDC where they withdrew their application from the CPC. So to her, that was proof that it wasn't her fault. They said in the email that they withdrew it because the landlord was not, in their experience, the landlord was not serious about selling this at fair market value. So it proves that she's correct that they withdrew it, but there's a lot left unsaid there. That withdrawal came after the project had been in discussions in meetings for over a year, I believe. And there was this issue where the mayor was insisting that the fair value of the property was the value as assessed when you assumed it would be used as zoned. Um, and but the uh, uh, as watch CDC, to being used for housing. <laughs> Exactly. So watch CDC got an appraisal that said it was worth what the what the owner was asking for it if you assume that it will be rezoned and used for housing, which was what they were asking the, the city council to do to do a special permit. But so when she says in that email, we found he wasn't willing to sell it at market price at fair price. Does she mean fair price by the mayor's definition or does she mean fair price by some other definition? So it's a complicated story. And when we talked to has about it he didn't blame it totally on the mayor so seeing her be that defensive about it was really interesting well it's also interesting to me because it ties into like the mbta communities act because what's ed the contention there is that they need to have the housing that's within range of all these mbta the two mbta stations to be by right not special permitted not like with some, some sort of exceptions carved out and you can kind of see the contours of that in that they didn't even want to buy the land unless they were buying it as if it was only for industrial use, despite the fact that they're going to put housing on it. And that just seems like it's creating a, a bureaucratic hurdle that doesn't need to exist for something you didn't want to get done anyways. Yeah, there's a lot to that story where, you know, in what I, what it, what I saw in it, which I've seen happen many times since then, is that sometimes in Waltham, when there's a controversial issue, we really don't have a debate about the real issue. Like, is this a good idea or not? We have debates about people say that we have to do things a certain way because of the that's their interpretation of the law and then somebody else questions that interpretation and we tend to have big debates about and that's kind of been with the farm too like there's hasn't been a public debate about what's better you know to use it as to give it to use it as a community farm or use it for something else um, there's been tons of debates about, um, you know, what the mayor's asking them to approve a certain vote actually means. And it seems like that's the pattern. That's been the pattern as long as we've been following the city council. And, you know, we really um, need a new mayor to really break that pattern, probably. So that's why it's exciting that uh, the mayor's being challenged. Um, a quick prediction. Um, I think one of the biggest winners um, of this announcement is uh, Healthy Waltham. Um, Healthy Waltham, uh, 
if you've been listening to the show, you already know the conundrum of the future being up in the air. Um, the, their pantry was today. And then the next pantry is their last pantry before they have no options uh, over where they're going next. The city has said, uh, we're done with this uh, and you need to find somewhere else. And um, I remember just talking uh, with someone privy to the information um, last week, or maybe less than that. And I was like, do you guys have a plan? And they were like, no, we still, we still haven't found anything. But I think with this announcement, I think they will have no trouble. I think the city is going to work with them. I think they're going to find a spot uh, because I really, if they, if they do not, if they let the pantry fail or if they let it, if, if they take off the knees of the pantry again, I think it's just going to look so, so freaking bad. It's and so I think there's, a, <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of pressure now under the mayor to work with the work with healthy Waltham. I think they're going to win out big. I think they're going to get something nice. They're, they're at least be able to continue what they're doing where they're at. And, uh, and so I think without positive announcement, that wouldn't have happened. So those 400 people that are uh, getting food, every single pantry just uh, went out big because of Jonathan Paz. Prediction. So. I mean, if, he, if, it, if they well, that to comes down it. to like what you said, Chris, about what 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 our friend group seems to be talking about is not representative of what the whole city is talking about or what she prioritizes. So why do you think healthy it, Waltham is an issue where public pressure will cause her to actually do something differently? I mean, it's just the difference between the uh, the mayor is causing uh, a pantry friction versus the mayor caused a pantry to collapse <laughs> i think those are two different conversations when also you start they think they're trying to make movements towards using the the building on felton street for that like the thing on the city side so uh, they they can spin it i think at this point still like it's not past the point of no return so until we get to that point i think i, I think there's i mean yeah that's an interesting uh uh prediction that um you know people have talked about like oh maybe the mayor put 92 Felton out there because she wants Healthy Waltham to bid on it and claim it. The problem is the bid sucks and the mm -hmm. building sucks. Yep. And so maybe when Healthy Waltham decides not to, and then the mayor pulls the rug under them, she can say, well, 92 Felton was right there. The problem is the bid sucks and the building sucks. So no one wants to take that. And Healthy Waltham probably doesn't. Unless if you've seen pictures of the inside, like compared to like where like, you know, normal food pantries operate out of it. It's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for those who don't know, that's a building that used to be a dog pound a very long time ago. It's historic. It's been vacant for a long time. So it's not really clear that it's an appropriate place for serving people food. But it could be, I guess. Chris, do you think it could be? Because you've been involved in the pantry. I worked for Healthy Walton for two years. Not only that, um, here, here's a quick plug. I recently made a Patreon, um, which you can follow oh, yeah. if you'd like to support my work. Um, and I'm actually writing a whole little article um, for uh, my Patreon on 92 Felton Street um, and the history there. If you look up my Patreon, if you Google uh, me and Patreon, um, you'll see a public article about my work uh, with people experiencing homelessness. Um, and 92 Felton has a part of that. And I had written so much about 92 Felton Street that I decided that I would make it its own thing. And if you want to see that, I'm gonna post it uh, sometime next week and uh, I'm not gonna make that one public. So you have to give me some form of money to see this article and also just to support my work because <laughs> because uh, I am totally broke and uh, I do all these things and... Um, yeah, mm -hmm. actually, that, uh, that reminds me, I was gonna make a sort of an announcement on this on a previous show and then we got distracted yeah, by other yeah. things. But yeah, so people have asked me what, you know, how is Channel 781 funded and what can I do to support it, which is awesome. Right now, our costs are pretty low. Um, James and I are both fortunate enough to have full-time jobs that we get paid for and that we can also do this. Chris has a part-time job that he gets paid for and spends all the rest of his time doing work for the Waltham community that he doesn't get paid for, including Channel 781. So we talked about what are our financial needs for Channel 781, and right now our most urgent need is to keep Chris off the street. <laughs> proverbially <laughs> yeah so thank maybe you not uh, so proverbially yeah. no no seriously uh, i have with, i have with, trouble with, uh... so at some point waltham in the housing future, crisis we might ask for support for waltham data which yeah. produces this show but for now if you want to support us support chris's patreon that's actually the most urgent need for channel 781 and you're also supporting the other things he does for waltham so this is the longest plug for my Patreon ever, but it is, <laughs> it is relevant. 92 Felton Street. Okay. 
So 92 Fallon Street was an old dog pound in the city. And before that, it was um, something about water. It's a, it was an old water uh, main thing. A, th a thing that doesn't like to get talked about in Waltham enough, and I'm fortunate enough to have this platform that I can continue to bring it up, is that 92 Fallon Street served as a warming center bought from the city for two years. Um, and so what a warming center is, is uh, during the winter when people are unhoused, when, uh, and I'm talking about the people that aren't in shelters, because uh, there's a lot of uh, those in Waltham, but the people that literally have nowhere to go, uh, their, their addiction issues prevent them from staying in a shelter, their mental illness prevents them from staying in a shelter, they've lost all of their support networks, and they're really on their last leg. When those people experience extreme temperatures, um, People in the city of Waltham have been organized enough to pressure the city to open up a warming center. Unfortunately, uh, there's not enough. Uh, there was there was not enough public pressure to make this warming center habitable. So, 92 Fountain Street served for two years as a warming center, and so. Uh, and I, this was just at the same time uh, that I started getting involved in the unhoused community. This was in 2017, um, and I. Uh, Started so when I started talking to people, people were like, "Oh yeah, they opened this warming center, and it's the most barbaric, torturous situation I've ever been a part of." And so, uh, one of the first bits of um, uh, activism that I ever did, or journalism, I started interviewing the people that that stayed there, and um, I put their testimony online, and I was like, "God, this is a real issue. Like, people are sleeping on the ground on cement." and the lights can't be turned off and so and the heater was even broken anyway and so it was cold and they had they kept the lights on the entire time and they slept on concrete and so these are just like this it's also against the geneva code it's like actual to torture. torture yeah to, it's literally defined by the geneva uh, convention as torture for not for not letting someone sleep um and so uh I, I got contacted the newspaper at the time, and so I'll put up a few pictures um, uh, from the newspaper with me credited as the uh, photographer because I just went in and started taking pictures. Um, and so uh, they did that for two years. The second year was slightly better. They fixed the heating system, and you know there was talk that sometimes they would turn off the lights, uh, but. It's. I would like. I would like people of Waltham to remember that 92 Fountain Street served as this barbaric, disgusting example of how we treat people in Waltham. Sometimes when not enough people are paying attention. And so, if you'd like to read more about that, um, which is very lengthy and it goes into you know, what happened afterwards when the Community Day Center took over the Warming Center, um, and I served as their manager uh, in 2020, um, you can sign up for my Patreon um, and support me uh, doing that. Um, but. So that's the story of 92 Pound Street, and uh, and now they're trying to sell the building, and it still looks like shit, and no one wants to buy it because they're liable for anything uh, that the city um, didn't fix. So, I that's a great deal. I, yeah, I, I think uh, Josh, you actually asked me a question there that I didn't answer. I think we had finished the discussion of the mayor race, right? Uh, so. Something that uh, a friend of ours mentioned was that it's interesting because no one's ever run to the left of Jeanette McCarthy in a municipal sense. So I'm curious what happens there. Diana Blank, I think with her, you know, worldly politics, I think she's probably more to the left than uh, Jeanette, uh, but just municipally, the way she was framed, it was always to the right. And so I'm curious to see, because Waltham votes Democratic uh, across the board, um, even in the most conservative wards, uh, Elizabeth Warren wins out. Um, and so I'm very curious to see how left wing Jonathan goes, how left wing the mayor goes, and uh, and how that conversation goes. Yeah, so that brings up uh, uh, another interesting thing about this election, which is former police detective Sergeant Tim King is running. I don't know what his politics are. I'm going to guess he's not far to the left. Um, so there's going to be a lot of different points of view and a lot of different ideas of what, what Waltham is about represented in this election. It should be a really interesting one. It should be. And uh, I mean, we're going to be covering it the whole time, but I, I'm pretty sure unless unless somebody super, 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 super cool uh, comes out of the woodwork to run for mayor, I think we've already made our endorsement of Jonathan Paz uh, for mayor. So we can just get that out of the way now. 
I'm down with that. Yeah, I, I think that <laughs> I think that's it. I think that he's that what I think he's he stands out in that he's been doing these meetings and he's been organizing people around issues, whereas traditionally ward counselors only organize people around issues that are specific to their ward. And that's very different for Waltham, but I think it's a good thing. I think it's something he could continue doing as mayor. And um, I think it's an inevitable thing that over time people will organize more around issues and less around geography because what I talked about earlier, people don't live here their whole lives anymore. Okay, this episode is already really long and we have made the internal decision not to go over the last two city council meetings. Um, the, I mean, there were some interesting things discussed. Uh, the MBTA's Communities Act continued. Uh, where we saw very contentious people talking about uh, the reality that Waltham might become a little more dense. Um, we saw- We'll have more coverage of that in the future. Yeah, 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 definitely. I, I think we're all interested in that. This is just a really long episode and we're kind of tired. Um, uh, we saw that the um, the contested Antico land at Prospect Hill Park uh, was settled for a ridiculous amount of money, way more money than it was worth using CPA money. Um, we saw the uh, rat uh, rodenticide um, issue come up uh, and it was spurred forward because of the passing of a bald eagle that was born in Waltham uh, from rodenticide. Uh, you saw a couple of, you saw a little bit of traction there. There's some things that have happened with the Fernald Recreational Plan, but I couldn't get the full story in time for tonight. So I'll update people on that next week. Uh, yeah, a lot of talk on the MBTA's Communities Act and... And there'll be more coming in future uh, meetings. Yeah. This and is an ongoing thing. And, and also and there'll be more of this in uh, license and not license and franchise, the other one, rules and ordinances. Yeah. And there was also more stuff on the farm as well. Um, it's just moving forward. Uh, and there's a lot of grandstanding involved. Uh, that's that's essentially the cliff notes of it. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so this was a good episode. I thought it was a uh, good content. Um, excited to see what this election year brings. So thank you, uh, Josh, James, Eamon, Noah, for coming on. Uh, and we will see you next week. Hopefully to uh, catch you up on all the things we were able to talk about today. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks a lot, everyone.